Somebody asked me on an online forum <laughs> how much how much did all of this cost, and I said, frankly, I don't want to know. Oh, I can't show that to Cherie. <laughs> right? Well, I start a lot of marital fights in our Facebook group. Look at the size of these panels. I've never heard of anybody putting residential panels on an RV. 4,100 watts. Yeah. Basically, our entire roof is either solar or ACs. So you're not going to go any bigger than that? Um, well, well, so would you recommend a DIY project like this or hire a professional? How much money do you have? For someone that's looking at this lifestyle for the very first time and they're thinking, well, I can't afford that, what would you tell them? What advice would you give to newbies just starting out? People ask us all the time, so when is this experiment going to end? Hi guys, we have a real treat for you today. We met Joshua and Elizabeth here while we're free camping with this view right here, the Teton National Forest. What do you think of this view, guys? Oh man, it's amazing. Even with the few other trailers that are here, it's just so beautiful to wake up in the morning, look out the window, see the mountains, and the weather's been really great. Yeah. Right, there's so many things we could talk about, uh, just the free camping right. right here, which is amazing, but that's not why we're talking to you guys today, because <laughs> Your story is so fascinating. Uh, wait till you hear what Elizabeth does for income on the road and the upgrades you guys have done to this <laughs> RV. Yeah. I mean, you give us envy in so many ways. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it, it, so it's a real treat. Uh, the solar setup, my gosh, I've never seen a solar setup like that. Mm -hmm. You have Starlink. For yes. internet. Yes, we do. And I just did a speed test this morning and we'll show you guys that in a little while. <laughs> that, that is super cool. And you've got a secret for, hack for making that work. Yep. That's awesome because all of us think it's too early for RVs. Yep. And you've got a way around that. Plus again, uh, just, I think you have every optional upgrade there is <laughs> <laughs> for this. My, my wife would like us to slow down for sure, yeah. uh, but I'm always interested in cool stuff. <laughs> Does the RV fly as well? Or? <laughs> Not yet, maybe 2024. Okay, right. <laughs> all, all, all right, that's awesome. So what kind of RV do you guys have? We have a Grand Design Solitude 390 RKR, which the last R, for those of you who don't know, stands for residential. It means we have an upgraded package for our appliances, our stove, and our refrigerator, both residential size, which you'll see in a little bit. Um, but also, it's built for full-time living, and that was a really? big thing for us. Yeah. Okay. And, and I know a lot of RVs say that, and I put quotes with built for full-time right. living, because <laughs> there's no perfect RV that's going to just exist and not break but uh, this one has supposedly been built for us to put it through you know the ringer every day and okay and the rk is the rear kitchen so that's one of the things that we liked the most about this is instead of having a kitchen in the middle like most rvs do where you have to have basically walkways on three sides so you're very limited we have one walkway in and we have a full wraparound um, kitchen with an island so it gives us lots of space yeah. to do a lot of cooking and, and when you see it a little bit later you'll realize why my wife says that this kitchen is bigger than our first apartment in houston texas <laughs> uh, that's really cool to hear that and you guys are going to give us a tour yeah that is super cool. Okay, there, there are multiple reasons why we picked this rig. One was the residential one and the rear kitchen. But really, honestly, like I wanted one that felt like when I was in the living room, I wasn't in the kitchen. And when I was in the kitchen, I wasn't in the hallway. I wanted to feel like I had spaces to be in. Because as my wife says, if it feels too small, I'll want to be somewhere else. And so we picked one that had a very tall ceiling in the living room that gave me the seat, the, just the, the feeling of being in a big space. And uh, the storage on this thing, which you'll see, is ridiculous. Yeah. Massive, <laughs> massive. I, I mean, it, it's probably, uh, I don't know, four times the storage that we have on our momentum. <laughs> you know, and the, 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 the kind of naked truth about the amount of storage that we have is that you can't use it all or you're overweight. And so there, even though there is this cool feature, you always have to moderate that with how much can I really carry? Right, like we were talking about uh, last night, the third axle would be uh, helpful on this yeah. model. It would be huh? a massive change if uh, we had the triple <laughs> axles on this. Okay, yeah. awesome. Well, you guys are not alone on this journey. No. Tell us about your uh, other uh, 
travelers here. Oh, we, we got a couple friends with us when we decided um, that we wanted to do this whole full-time thing, which is right New Year's of 2020, about a year and a half ago. Uh, we said, well, it's finally time for us to get some dogs. So we got Dora. Yep. Uh, she was a rescue in Houston. She lived in an apartment that didn't allow dogs and they got caught and had to turn her in. And so she came home with us. Yeah. Oh, and when, when we went to visit there, we knew immediately we walked in and all the dogs were losing their minds, barking, you know, and all that. And she just was standing in the corner of her little pen, just smiling. And I said, that one? That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's calm and yeah. Um, and then she, you know, she was just having so much fun playing with my mom's dogs when we visited. Uh, we were like, she's going to be lonely. So we got this little guy who was a street dog in Mexico. His name is Diego. Uh, it, <laughs> her name she... was Dora, so it just, it worked. And she's Dora, the RV explorer. Uh, right. Diego, what are you doing, buddy? Diego, and then, um, come on, buddy. Yeah, so, so he, he, uh, he likes warm things. So he loves boondocking because <laughs> we don't have the AC cranked down he like normal. So he's very happy. Loves the temperature, huh? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's very cool. You've got your furry friends yeah. along. Yeah. So. They have the back seat of the truck that's their domain and yep. When we travel, they get the whole but. spot. And we always say that uh, you know, they they love their life cuz they get to pee on more things than the average dog. <laughs> yeah. They've, they've claimed spots in 22 states so far. <laughs> Always new trees. Yes. yes. <laughs> new tires. And that actually that... you bring up a funny point. When we first started taking Dora um, away from Houston, Texas, we're heading to she, Arizona. She had a hard time going to the restroom because there was no more grass. She didn't oh. pee. She didn't pee for 24 <laughs> hours because there was no grass. So it, it, it's even taken oh. her a little while to get used to the changes in terrain. <laughs> what is all yeah. this sand and dirt? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> they love it now, though. And, and cactus. <laughs> oh yeah, we've had some near scares with cactus because they don't understand it and they get real close. But her favorite thing is all the new animals she gets to chase. Some places have squirrels, oh, others right. have rabbits. Oh, uh, I see rabbits your ears perked up there a little lizards. bit. So. <laughs> oh yeah, whatever she can try to get. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah. Well, where are you guys from originally? Um, I'm from Tucson, Arizona, and my family was missionaries in Mexico, so I'm also from Mexico. Uh, I'm from uh, southern Indiana, but I also moved to Mexico as a missionary, so I'm from both as well. And okay. then for the last four years before we decided to go full-time, we were living in Houston, Texas. So our plates and our registration, everything's in Texas. Our domicile address is still Texas. So legally, we are still Texas residents, although home is now where you park it. <laughs> right, exactly. And I think Texas is a good state to have Te your Texas domicile. Texas is a good state tax-wise, it's a good state business-wise, and so, you know, all yeah. of our businesses are still registered there. Um, you know, if we were ever to change, there are a few other ones, but it really didn't make any sense for us to choose those other ones when we were already rooted in Texas. Yeah. Right. So, what made you guys decide this lifestyle, the full-time RV lifestyle? Oh, goodness. So, I'll go back to 2019. Um, I had been growing several local businesses. I had co-working facilities and a local coaching business and was growing really, really fast. Um, and then a few things happened that were outside of our control that caused us to have to close those businesses. And that was extremely devastating for me. Um, I have this thing inside me that's always built bigger. Every time I do something, it's a little bit grander than the thing I did before. Um, and what had happened was I decided that after that closure that I wanted more quality uh, and less quantity, right? I wanted to be able to enjoy what I was doing and not feel as burdened as we had felt building these huge businesses. Yeah. Even the fact that, you know, uh, nine years of marriage and we'd never gotten a dog because we were always working, 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 and we would never have time to take care of it. Even little things like that. Yeah. It's like, you know, we're spending our whole life spinning our wheels and we don't have time to enjoy the life that we're right. trying to build. I mean, we were generating so. hundreds of thousands of dollars in revenue and not making money, if you know what I mean. You right. Know, yeah. I, I, I yeah. can really relate to your story because I was kind of the same way, entrepreneur, building this big DJ mm -hmm. company, but the bigger I built it, you know, the, yeah, the less money I made, right. the more stress I had. Yes. And the more time you're spending, right. Right. Because you're not spending on anything with your family. Exactly. Or, yeah. And so after that had closed and I got over my initial depression, we'll just call it, we were driving home from Arizona visiting her family for Christmas and, and the New Year's. And I just, 
off the cuff, but had been watching videos, she had no clue. <laughs> I've been watching videos of like tiny home and RV living and I just kind of glanced over and I said, what would you think of living in a tiny house? Fully expecting her to be like, are you high? <laughs> now, keep in mind, in all of the places that we lived, and we'd been moving about every year pretty much in the time we'd been married, um, we had always had a room that was my harp studio, usually a bedroom or a den or something. I was used to having an entire room devoted to all my harps and all my music and all my everything. Um, I would have my students come for their lessons in the studio. Yeah. So the idea of a tiny home was like, how would this work? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. But, but initially you were excited about it. It was just trying to figure out the logistics. So then, you know, when, when I realized she was on board, then it was, it, it changed to, okay, so what? Class A, class C, class B, you know, fifth wheel. What are we gonna, are we gonna build a tiny house? Are we gonna have a schooling? I mean, like, there were literally so many options that it took right. us months to figure that part out. That is such a great story. And I think that is really inspirational for so many out there that are in the rat race yeah. and no time for themselves, for mm -hmm. family, uh, and yeah, to maybe have a pet. Mm -hmm. And that you can, change your thinking if you're willing to look outside the box yeah this living this lifestyle doesn't mean you can't build an empire it just means you literally own the land that your empire sits on <laughs> right <laughs> and I, I think and we're going to get into the technology that makes this happen here but we had this discussion yesterday about how off-grid living like this and free camping like this does not have to mean that you can't be glampers. Uh, yeah. You cannot have <laughs> exactly. all of the niceties yeah. that you had before. Fast internet, right. uh, full kitchen. Right. Uh, <laughs> Three ACs. <laughs> right. Yeah. You, know, it, it, you, you bring up a great you know uh, topic because people think that if you're going to live this lifestyle you have to like wear overalls and like be a <laughs> farmer and, and the thing is is the truth is we're not outdoorsy people like not that much we have pushed ourselves to enjoy some new things and right. maybe do a little hiking but before we weren't outdoorsy people and we're still really not but we get to live in it and there's a difference between being a hiker and just enjoying the mountain view yeah yeah right i mean and we'll turn the camera soon too but i mean right out uh, you know this slide here you've got Mount Moran yeah just right yeah. there with the glacier Beautiful. on there and it's just you know <laughs> million dollar view zero dollars per night yes. right <laughs> exactly exactly and, yeah. and you know to those of you watching this video he has you know uh, mentioned before that we, we can't worry about mistakes and instead of trying to this is our first boondock week like this is first our one. very first week off grid with no backup plan. We can't plug into a post that's right next to us. So I mean, we're definitely in the throes of figuring out mistakes. <laughs> Hope and, this and, works. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that that is cool. So initially, it looks like you guys have everything put together, but yep. there was a lot of mistakes. Oh, along the way, for sure. <laughs> right. Dora. So talking about like your goal of getting Dark. that thing you want maybe it's this lifestyle to go full time it's not like a straight line it's oh, that no. meme yeah. of ups and downs and setbacks yeah. and things cost a lot more than you yeah. thought they were they always do yeah. Yeah. Or they take more time than you thought they would um and just the fact that if you if you want something it's not that you go out and find it it's more like well this is what how am I gonna make this work yeah so it's not so much like well this is what I have to you know just exist in but like well I need this so how can I how make I it work there? yeah how do I like like my my harp studio how do I record my videos in this setup and we figured out a way to do it so when you need it you find a way yeah R right is staying positive and not thinking it can't be done mm -hmm. and isn't the world full of that or you can't do that. Right. Yeah. right. You hear yeah. all the time. You can't live like that. Yeah. You can't do that thing. Right. But if you flip that mm -hmm. to well, it, there is possibility. Something yeah. that helps with those possibilities is a phrase we use around here a lot, which is done is better than perfect. Because if you wait <laughs> till like it is it. perfect, you never, never get to experience anything. It never goes live. You never get to take it anywhere, test it, or do anything with it. Yeah. You know, so done means you it, find the problems, you fix the problem. Exactly. 
Man. So how long has it taken you to get to this point where you were set to actually go boondocking? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, we bought the rig 14 months ago, so um, just over a year. And it's it's just been a constant string of modifications and changes and you know building desks and replacing the furniture and upgrading computers and just so many things. Um, and the solar was one step along the way, something he'd been wanting to do for a long time and the opportunity presented itself. We decided to do a DIY it with some friends. <laughs> We're like, it'll take about a month. Sure. And mm -hmm. we were budgeting about 15 grand. Yep. <laughs> and neither of those two things <laughs> turned out. <laughs> it took so, uh, how many states? It's three months. Uh, basically, our friends that we were working with were, they, they do um, jobs. And so they're, or sorry, construction projects. And so the company, when the company moves them, they got to move. And so we, since we work online and we can work from wherever, we're like, well, we, you know, we can't do it on our own. We don't have the technical knowledge. So we got to go follow them. Like, oh, they're in California now where all the RV parks are expensive. I guess we got to go get an expensive RV park for a couple of weeks to finish this up, you yeah. know? So it, it, yeah. it took about, about three months. Yeah, oh, three there. months just for the solar project. Just the solar. Yeah. I mean, that was nights oh. and weekends, you know, and it was a lot of work and I would be doing the things I could do. But as I've told everyone, I'm like, I'm the blunt instrument. So he would say, drill a hole, cut a board, and I would do those things. But full on knowledge. <laughs> and then knowledge, you would say, why did you do it like that? I'm like, well, you didn't, you didn't specify. You're right. <laughs> so now we got to redo it. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, it was, it was a long journey, but as it's gone, I've actually picked up more knowledge and, you know, watched the guys and figured out what, and we had an, is an issue here not that many days ago here boondocking where we woke up and our 12 volt power was off and I had to crawl down in there with a handful of tools and a guy on a video call and just start working on stuff and, and I'm, so, yeah. I'm glad we had internet because that was the other thing people keep telling us like oh well you can't you can't go out in the boondocks uh, you know because you won't have any signal and you right. gotta work and like well but but we do have signals. So. You, you guys have amazing <laughs> internet, and thank you for letting me bum oh, off of that sure. as well. Uh, so. we've, we've been. Jo I joked with her the other night, and I said, "What I need to do is put a paywall on there, so that all the people that pull in we here." We share internet with so many people. <laughs> there, there you go. <laughs> that that's probably a brilliant idea sure. right there. <laughs> Somebody will take that idea yeah, and sure. turn Run that with it. into yeah. an income opportunity. <laughs> So how has your jobs or careers changed? Mm -hmm. You talked about what you did before, but you're still doing the same thing, just you found a solution yes. to do it on the road. So tell us about that. Well, I'll start with mine. So I've had uh, really two different careers. So I'm a professional harpist and all of my gigs and playing for things with the pandemic that all kind of shut down so that took care of itself <laughs> um, all but one of my clients that i had booked had canceled so i just found a sub for the one that didn't um, and m then i teach harp as well and i was already thinking well how am i going to convince all my students to go online especially the ones who are older because a lot of my students are retirees um, kind of fulfilling their lifelong dream of wanting to learn the harp, bucket list kind of thing. And I was like, these people aren't going to want to switch to online lessons and they're going to, you know, go move to some other teacher. Then the pandemic hit and everybody had to move online. And a lot of these people were teachers themselves and they had to learn to teach online. So suddenly it was very acceptable. So that worked out really well for me. And then the other part of my job is I'm also a certified teacher of the visually impaired. So I specialize in working with blind students on braille and assistive technology. And I had been working in an inner city Houston school uh, district. I was servicing 14 schools, driving from school to school, working with different kids on different things. And again, it was like, well, how, what am I going to do? I'm going to have to leave this job. Well, then everything went online. So <laughs> um, what I'm doing now is I have um, several part-time jobs with different school districts. I'm working with multiple school districts in multiple states, but because I'm a contractor and part-time, I'm able to control my own schedule. I don't have to be working, you know, eight to three or something. I can schedule my sessions with kids when I want to. For example, yesterday we um, were really close to Yellowstone, so we drove up and saw Old Faithful and, and some different things up there, and I just rescheduled my students for another day so that we were free to uh, make, take advantage of the things that are around us and where we're staying right now. 
So um, that's been mine. I'm, I'm focusing on building a lot of um, harp videos and, and curriculum. I'm designing a new program for beginning harp um, that's uh, hybrid online with pre-recorded lessons and live video chat lessons. I have my own harp curriculum that I'm finally, finally publishing. So um, I'm staying super busy and yeah. really excited. I've been able to take those specialties and all that experience I have and just adjust it to fit this lifestyle, which I absolutely love. You know, it's funny that she says it that way because when we were driving to Yellowstone yesterday, I remember you said something along the lines of, we never would have had time to do this before. True. And I said, correction, we wouldn't have made time yes. to do this before. And so now that we have that opportunity to just kind of make the time everywhere we go, no matter what our job is, we take the time for at least one day to experience something, take the harp out, get some photos, and really just enjoy our surroundings. That's been really fun. I bought this carbon fiber harp, um, which is very light, very durable, and we have taken it to some of the most ridiculous places. We have amazing photos from 22 states now, uh, waterfalls and up at the top of lighthouses and just in, in ridiculous places, and it's it's so much fun. So. so what do I do now? Well, what I did before is I had co-working spaces, as I said, and I was a business coach and I worked one-on-one -on -one with local business owners who were starting their first business or who were growing and expanding. And after we closed those physical locations and I decided to go online, I was wanting to get back to my roots. And originally, many, many years ago, I was a digital marketer and a web developer. And so I pulled those parts of my brain back to the front and I said, what can I do with these that I will most enjoy? And so what I have started doing, along with developing a lot of things for my wife, uh, I build educational websites for people who really want to teach and share and help others around them grow. These might be people who are in the coaching business. These might be people who have a service business like, say, uh, I've worked with a electrician who wanted to show people how to fix their own problems. So we built an educational website. When he does that, eventually some of these customers get a little over their heads and they call him to come fix it. Why? <laughs> because he shared all this knowledge with them and has built this relationship through education. And that brings the most reward for me, helping people help people. And so there have been clients that I've turned down because it felt more like they were doing a money grab. They just wanted to share something so everyone would pay for it and it was all sizzle, no substance. And so we are really selective, only take on a few clients a year. And that allows me the time to not be the guy who was working from 5 a.m. to midnight every single day because he got a lot done, but he was really not happy with his lifestyle. Yeah. I really love this part of your story, uh, especially Elizabeth, you're talking about how there was these massive challenges to doing this lifestyle, mm -hmm. but then COVID happened and it's a very negative thing in a lot of ways, but there was positive things for yeah. you. And like we've mentioned before that within every challenge there is a seed of an opportunity right. yes. and that's not our quote that's somebody else's sure. quote and i don't have whose it is <laughs> right now but uh so don't look at a challenge like you can't do something it's like what can you make out of that right and it yes. just it, it, fits in it, this it is perfectly. definitely a mindset change yes. like you have to shift how you think in order to take these opportunities because otherwise mm -hmm. all she would have said is we can't go because none of my people will go online. We can't go because I don't have a dedicated room for my harp studio. Or I would have said, how am I going to build a physical business if I'm out there, you know? I, inst yeah. But instead of those things, we said, okay, what has this done to create this opportunity for us? It, it forced yeah. her students online. It made me re-examine myself and what it was I was going to do. Mm -hmm. And through that introspection and all of our choices, I mean, I don't think we'd trade. People yeah. ask us all the time, so when is this experiment going to end? Well, when like, are when are you back, back to reality? Trip. You know, and, <laughs> and we're like, when the wheels fall off like we're not we're not done with this till it's done with us you yeah. know <laughs> so it's we're not on a trip it's it's a new lifestyle right. so and that's what people don't always understand <laughs> you know even um i i play uh the the big pedal harp that you see in orchestras and that was one of the challenges thinking about well that thing it's huge it's heavy it's fragile it, there's no way that it would survive traveling like this um, but yet that's been my bread and butter for so many years and I you know, studied it in college and, and all of this 
and I decided, you know what, I'm going to rent it out, not willing to sell it, but I, I found a, a long-term renter for it, and then I bought this other uh, travel-friendly harp um, using the, the money, the, the rental income from the one to make the payments on the other one, and so it, you just, you find a way, even with those things, like there's no way because the harp that I use that is my performance harp that I teach on, that I do everything on, can't handle this. Well, then you would shift and you adjust and you find one that you can. That is so cool. Well, show us your harps. <laughs> sure. Um, so this is the one that I bought. Um, it's from a company called Kamek in Paris, France. It's made out of carbon fiber, all of the black. So it's very light. It's only 17 pounds. It's very durable. It's handled all the shaking, all the temperature changes, humidity changes. Every time we've knocked yeah. it over. It does have a wooden soundboard. So you have that really nice wooden soundboard sound as opposed to ones that are all carbon fiber. But it's the perfect size. I'm able to teach on it. I'm able to perform on it. Um, I've, I've done weddings and funerals and parties and proposals and just the different places we go. Um, sometimes something will pop up and I'll get hired to play for an event and even though we're only there for a couple weeks and so it's been really fun. Um, and then I also have some other harps that I've gotten. I have this little lap harp. I played that in the ocean, uh, you know, strapped it on me and it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, so. I don't have the strap on it right now, but I do have the lap bar, so you can just set it on your lap and play. Oh, facing the wrong way. Um, and I apologize, I'm not sure when I last tuned to this guy. Yeah, it's a little out of tune, but... <laughs> it sounded it's beautiful a... <laughs> to me. <laughs> so it's a, it's a fun little harp, and I can do an awful lot with it as well. So um, I have, most of my harps are still in Houston, Texas. I rent them out to my students that are now online. Um, and so it's, it's been really fun being able to uh, just experience everything and, and take all these photos with all these harps in crazy places. Well, and for those of you <laughs> out there who are in uh, the RV life or, you know, kind of the off-grid trailer existence, you know, in some land who think that there's no way you can do this, this is a really good size harp for getting mm -hmm. started and we've recently become really good acquaintances with the company that makes these and we're, we're trying to help make them available. I think we may have three or four mm -hmm. more coming in. And yeah. so folks who are interested in this, you know, we can help you find a harp if they don't, don't have one in your area. And definitely if you don't have a teacher, Elizabeth would love to help you out with that. <laughs> All you right. need is internet. <laughs> and what we'll do is we'll put links for you guys, what you want to share sure. down the video description sure. and also links to pick up a harp yeah, like sure. this. I know there's people out there that want to try this out because it's so beautiful and I just have to keep pointing out the view. What is yeah. the view like yeah. to, for inspiration as far as, you know, practicing Absolutely. and teaching? And, and I've written a number of songs for my beginning harp curriculum that I've named after some of the places where we were. Um, that were just inspired me and I started playing stuff and I was like oh that's I need to put that in my curriculum and um, so it's even fun looking back and as I see the names I, I'm I'm remembering those places where that inspiration came it's it's a lot of fun I use um, our kitchen as my harp studio since we've got a nice big wraparound kitchen there's an eat-in bar that has been turned into my desk so I've got my harp, I just stick it on a little uh, crate my husband built for me that raises it up. And basically I've got my, my dual monitor set up here, all my stuff. So um, I've got my camera, I've got lights. I normally have a backdrop here wow. um, so that it's really easy for my students to see things. And then I've got multiple cameras so I can switch and they can see exactly, you know, I can zoom in on my hand position or something to demonstrate for the students. So I try to make it really easy for them. It's normally a little easier to see because I have a backdrop, but. <laughs> what an amazing setup for teaching. I mean, you yeah. guys have like yeah. gone all out. Yeah, it's got a lot. <laughs> it's, it's definitely evolved over time, but her camera and light in the center is now permanently fixed. So it's not something we have to remove. Mm -hmm. The only thing we do is this light fits down in this little hole and then her monitors get strapped down and we're on the road. Yeah, it's it's nice and easy. Very yeah. cool. I always have my, my music up here. I do screen shares. I draw on the on the music so they know what they need to write onto theirs and it, it's just worked very efficiently. 
Yeah, I mean, and multi-purpose. You got your kitchen here, but you also have your <laughs> desk and workstation. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, Joshua, you've got yours down yeah, here. Yeah, my workstation is down here. Um, I have a bad back, so I like a nice chair. Some people come in and they're just like, oh my gosh, that's a big, huge chair. But it, it's the best for me. Uh, we built this. A friend of mine, uh, Fabian, who is a construction, a home builder and a furniture builder in Dallas, Texas, he helped me build this from scratch to fit the space. Um, I have a, uh, a keyboard stand that can be, you know, adjusted so that it's best comfort. I, of course, also have two monitors. But one of the cool things about mine is we took an old hospital table that would normally go above a bed. And that's where I've mounted our printer and my desktop so that I could have an L desk. Because who said you can live in an RV and not have an L desk? I said, yes, you can. <laughs> uh, but when we're ready to go, then this just of course rolls right back in and then everything gets strapped together that is very cool and i see you've got your speed <laughs> up here so right now a, so speed test this morning and we were pulling down 270 70 mips and 21 mips up at a 40 millisecond uh, ping which is a little high but still better than our pep wave because sometimes while my at and i'm getting you know uh, a pings of 65 and 75 which are really high and so people who are saying starlink isn't ready yet it's too it still has too much latency i'm here to tell you it's getting better all the time so a lot of people think living in an rv means you cannot have decor or you have to put decor away every time you move and i am the kind of guy every time i look at something i say how can i fix you permanently so i don't have to touch you again so these here these are just walmart frames and they have velcro on the back um, so I can peel these off and change the photos, but in, uh, I want to say thousands of miles, they have not fallen down. It's all uh, according to not buying cheap adhesion products. So if you buy the cheap Walmart adhesive uh, Velcro, the heat on the wall will probably cause it to fall away. So go to Home Depot, buy the higher quality adhesive that has Velcro, and the stuff does not fall down. Over here, you can see a few that we have. These have museum putty. You can get that on Amazon. That holds this and this, and these are Velcroed. The museum putty, again, nothing has fallen down in thousands of miles of travel. I remember touring one of these with the rear kitchen at the Grand Design RV Rally, mm. and oh man, talk about kitchen envy in an RV, the space in these. So Elizabeth has her office in here, but this is really my domain. I do most of the cooking uh, and I enjoy it. And one of the reasons we got this rig was because of how much cabinetry we have in here and the surprise. So the one we toured did not have this range. It had the standard range top with the oven down here. And I had accepted that that was going to be my life. When we, this came in and we came to look at it for the first time and I saw this, I was in love <laughs> <laughs> because I, it, it really, you know, the oven works great. The stove works great. We really enjoy it. Um, the backsplash, you know, someone asked me all the time, what are some things you don't like? Um, we don't like how this is super hard to clean, you know, in between these crevices, it gets a little greasy, but Elizabeth recently bought a new tool that she puts in my drill and scrubs into that thing really good. <laughs> but, nice. uh, so we have a lot of modifications on this side. Um, I'll start here and work my way over. So they come standard with this drawer setup, but these drawers do not stay where they're supposed to stay. Soon as you move, if you don't have this uh, bungee shut, they come flying out. So we added these latches. Oh, nice. And that way we can carry heavy stuff and it's not, there's no threat of it coming out. We don't have to bungee this door anymore. And I'll tell you, the one reason this was most important was because on our very first trip, very first trip where we made tons of mistakes, the first <laughs> mistake was not bungeeing this door shut. And one of these came flying out so hard, the ball bearings flew out. Oh, so wow. day one already ruined a drawer, you know? Uh, the second thing we did on that trip was we did not latch the fridge. Oh, so we came in with slides out and there was food everywhere and i had like half a can of tomatoes in there <laughs> just like bad things oh. uh, so uh, another mod that we did is over here i took this door off the the hinges 
and I replaced it with a... Well, it's a regular door. Yeah, just like that one there. Did not have a shelf in it. And I put in this spice rack so that you, you'll find that some, one of the biggest battles isn't that you don't have storage space. It's that sometimes it's weird sizes and shapes because they've chosen to cram a cabinet in a weird spot. So it's about using that space to its best efficiency. And for this one, it meant trying to go as high as we could. And again, this one also has a latch so that we don't come home to spices everywhere. <laughs> really cool. <laughs> I was going to say, he, he made me oh. a little place for my uh, brooms and dustpan and vacuum and everything mop. This, this so, was just the piece of trim space. that was there and I just cut it and put some force closure hinges on it so that when it's closed, it holds itself shut <laughs> and just use the existing piece of trim because it was just wasted space. Right, and, and there's so many spaces like that yeah. in RVs, you would think that they would utilize every single space and yeah, often I think the for manufacturers them, don't. I think for them, what, what some of the feedback I was getting is it's, it's just about, uh, they don't want to take the time to customize so much because then it, it increases the amount of time it takes to build a unit, which increases cost, labor, and material, which drives the price up, which makes us angry because when we go buy another one, we don't want it to be a hundred thousand dollars more than what it was supposed to be. <laughs> right. <laughs> another mod we did up here is all of our countertops were this, uh, you know, formed countertop style, this kind of like fake marble. Um, I took that off of here and I replaced it with some glued pine so that I had a nice cutting board area, but also our trash can is just under here. So I pull this out and during food prep, I just toss everything down there uh, and it makes it a little bit easier and simpler. Also, I learned these things are incredibly heavy. Really? I do not understand why the countertops are so heavy. They're, uh, when I replace this weighs nothing because it's just glued pine boards, but these are so heavy, I'm actually contemplating removing all of them <laughs> just to shave some more weight because of the solar setup we have, which we'll show you in a little bit, added about 1,100, 1,200 pounds to our cargo. <laughs> That's a lot of weight to displace. Right. <laughs> Um, we This came with just a trash can here, but we went ahead and we put in our own trash can slide, just built it out of plywood so that we could put the tallest trash can. This is actually the trash can from our house. <laughs> the one this came with was like a little you know, 12 inch office trash can. No. And I was like, come on, I'm not emptying the trash. Not for the day. kitchen. <laughs> um, one of the other mods we did is there used to be some medium right here that would cover up the bottom of the sink. I took that out and I put in a pot and pan slide so that we could have all of our pots and pans. Oh, that's great. And our lids right here, easy to get to. Of course, it would do that as soon as I show it. <laughs> now, we did buy a smaller set to move in because before we had so many pots and so many pans. And so everything went through a pare down. But I did go ahead and buy a specific set that um, kind of nests better. It doesn't look as nested in this in this uh, way, but uh, it, it does do that. Oh, I can't show that to Cherie. Right? <laughs> well, I start a lot of marital fights in our Facebook group. Because I'll do a mod and then I post it. And then the husband is told he has to do it. Or the husband sees something technical I've done. And he wants to do it and the wife's not happy. And so I'm, I've, I'm definitely a troublemaker in our Facebook group. <laughs> Uh, over here, what we did is because these are so deep, I was afraid of things getting back there. We put these little wire slides in so that we can access everything in the back. We did it um, all across these top ones here. Those are cool. Yeah. And there are some people who are worried about the weight that these add. These are very light. They add very little weight. The actual issue with installing these is the bottom of this cabinet is basically wafer board. Like it's nothing. So don't put super duper heavy stuff in the front and then light things in the back and expect it to operate well. You to make sure you even your loads um, on these kinds of drawer slides. Yeah, that, that is amazing. I mean, you guys have really made some amazing upgrades to an already, uh, already I think super it's, spacious. I think it's the best kitchen I've ever seen in a fifth wheel. <laughs> Uh, already so, so for those of you who say you can't have a uh, high-end desktop in a rig you can um, just what we do is it is permanently fixed I don't know if you can see this I have uh, put a screw in here which screws into this cabinet and this cabinet is screwed into the floor so none of this moves at all during transit um, I do have a little bit of rubber under here just in case it decides to a bounce or rub a little bit but you know it's just about fixing things that you don't need to move so that you can have nice things because when you don't fix them they'll move and they'll break <laughs> exactly and so tell us about the pc what what are you running there 
So we are running MSI desktops on both um, uh, both of ours and also um, our laptops are all MSI. These typically are known for being gaming computers. We're not gamers, uh, but we do a lot of video work. And so that requires a lot of specialized power that's coming just for your videos, uh, just for rendering videos, extra RAM just for videos that your normal PC isn't going to be able to handle. In fact, she had a MacBook Pro that she was doing all of her work on and the fan was running constantly it just could not do it it was starting to die and so i convinced her to come over to the dark side and get <laughs> an msi desktop and get a msi laptop because they're really well-known brand for being powerful um yet durable that's a little bit like sheree and i i'm a pc she's a mac and you know so i'm constantly having to like relearn things on the Mac to troubleshoot it, things. <laughs> it has helped me. So. It has helped me a lot with getting us both on the PC realm because now if I'm troubleshooting something on mine, it's the same on hers versus before, like you said, the same software on both computers is radically different, operates differently. Everything's in different places. And that can be frustrating when you're trying to fix something or figure out why something isn't working. Which, which happens a lot with computers a lot. <laughs> and technology. A lot. <laughs> Yeah. Like more than it should. <laughs> oh boy, this this workspace again just so amazing. Yeah, I'm I'm a, ca a cable management freak. That's why I have this here. It's on hinges in the back, uh, and the, the, all of her desktop cables just kind of fit underneath here, so she can have as many cables as she wants. But it's not a mess. Um, I put this little guy on the back just because I wanted to allow her to be able to let this be as messy as she wanted, but yet it not bleed over into the living room space. <laughs> I have cable management down there. Everything's tied up. It, it's, I'm just a neat freak. You don't have to be like this. You can just get her done. But <laughs> <laughs> That's more like me. <laughs> yeah. Do you guys have a big enough TV? Uh, you know, when we toured the rig, the, the salesman pointed out the big screen TV that was on the wall, and he said it was 55. And I said, there's no way it's 55. And I got out my tape measure, and it was 49. And I said, that's not a big screen TV. <laughs> so we originally upgraded to a 75 inch. Um, that rode on this wall for nearly a year. And then Christmas last year, I upgraded to a newer uh, version of the TV and actually went down to 65. And I find the 65 is really a better size for this wall because the 75 would come all the way out and make getting behind the TV really difficult. This one makes it a lot easier. But TV is a big part of our wind down routine. And so it's important to us that it's quality. And well, I should say it's important to me that it's quality. I don't think Elizabeth wouldn't care either way. But <laughs> like the ultimate glamping right, right here huge tv <laughs> when we were talking yesterday i had oh you've got this massive solar setup and you have starlink but then i come in here and you have so many other upgrades it's like yeah somebody asked me on an online forum how much how much did all of this cost and i said frankly i don't want to know because it's been over 14 months you know it's not like we bought it like this or we started like this it's every little thing has come in its own time um but uh yeah it's it's definitely a labor of love for me i get a, a, a dopamine boost every time i install something or change something that's better for us and uh, that's part of this life that's really brought me a ton of joy so you know sometimes when you're as technical as us and you want to have an actual interior network you're not running everything on wi-fi you need to run cables but you don't want to drop the underbelly and you don't want to you know get into the ceiling so i went to menards and i got some plastic snap end c channel and i found some spray paint that was very very close to our wood trim and i made this channel that we could run our WeBoost cable in i run all my cat six through it and it goes all the way to the back wall because on the back wall we have a exterior box where we connect uh, we can take a cable out and actually connect into someone else's network or we can connect to our WeBoost and send that up if we need to so one of the things like we've talked about is the storage can be weird shapes sometimes and maybe not useful. So these had uh, hanging racks across, uh, rods across them and that wasn't good for us. So I took a jig and I drilled uh, holes um, ever so many inches all the way down all four sides and then was able to put in these adjustable little brackets cut the plywood to shape so that we can have the storage that's exactly what we need and if our needs change we can change the, uh, the cabinets to do so. And then if I can show you this yeah i'll just take them out so this is how we access our batteries our batteries live behind our fireplace 
So all the way down here, I've created a little bulkhead and I have a little door. I take out two screws and there's a tray on rollers down here that I can pull my batteries all the way out through my door and maintenance my batteries, replace a battery if I have to do so. But now they're still out of the way and essentially kind of out of mind because they live behind all of our uh, jackets and our shenanigans down there. And what are you running for batteries? Uh, what, what type of battery? Um, right. I, I have 100 amp hour uh, Battleborn batteries. Okay, and 10 of those. We have 10 of those. So we're running a thousand, uh, let's see, a thousand amp hours, which I think equates to 12,000 watt hours, um, which is a lot. Most people don't run this many batteries, but I, I don't do anything check. small, as you can probably tell from the beginning of this video. And I wanted to have more than we needed to be able to, you know, be able to boondock, but have somewhat some security of still having power. Like this morning, we ran two ACs last night till we went to bed and we still woke up with 77% battery and we're now we're at, we'll just see. And we have not turned our generator on. We've been yeah. here, what, four days? Uh, we've been running ACs, we've been doing our computers, watching TV, everything. We have not had to turn on our generator yet, so. so and right now we're at 88% battery and we're generating 1600 watts, well 1514, it's, you know, it moves as the clouds roll by, but we're almost to 100%, um, and which makes my heart happy. <laughs> we're, we're, we're gonna need some AC today, it's gonna be hot. <laughs> right, so I, this is I think a part that people are really waiting for to hear about this solar setup, and before we look at the panels, uh, first, how long can you run two full air conditioning units in this RV? So we did a test when we first flipped the switch and we turned both ACs on down to like what 60 degrees or something like that. Um, and we actually ran into a low voltage issue before we ran out of battery. What happened oh. was we forgot the third AC was still on. Really? And so we had two ACs on one line tried to come on and that caused my multi plus to get a little unhappy with us and it shut down. So, but we were at 40% and it was like 60 degrees, maybe 59 in here, just well, constantly running. We and, were running all kinds. We had our electric water heater on. Yeah, we, we were doing had, a pressure test. We, we were trying to like knock it down. So I don't know that we have an answer to your question because we haven't, we haven't, I'd say since we've been boondocking, um, We've been running two ACs for some of the time, mm -hmm. and I don't think we've ever gotten below 60%. We've never dropped below 60% even the following morning. Yeah. So that's the first I've ever heard of anybody in an RV being able to run two air conditioning units all of the time and how hot of temperatures have you done that so in? So we, we have done that in temperatures up to 100 degrees, not by choice. We went to Montana uh, just to, just before here to escape the heat. And to set up our Starlink. And to set up our Starlink, but the, when we got there, Montana suddenly decided to become 108 degrees. So we were there, we were still like at a park being able to plug in, but stress testing our, our solar. And so we were running, we can run our kitchen and our bedroom or our kitchen and our living room can run at the same time. It's just that our living room and bedroom are on the same line. So we have to decide which one is running. right. When we're plugged in, they can both, they can all run at the sure. same time. Right. So it's just a matter of when we're on the solar or just running off the batteries, then we have to. Essentially, <laughs> for those of you out there that have, that have plugged into like double Double pull 30 amp because there was no 50 amp. Our solar runs a lot like that, where we're kind of on double 30 amp, if you will. So I can't run everything. Like if our space heater was on in the fireplace and the electric water heater and then AC kick on, probably going to trip out my my uh, multi plus my inverter and it's going to shut down and then restart. So you do have to be selective, but we do have as much solar and battery as probably can be put on our rig. So we we do run most things. But I mean, that again, just if you're minimizing power on other items, you pretty much consistently with full sun like this, you could run oh, two ACs yeah. all day. If I, I could run two ACs all day because our top wattage up top is probably about 3,900, it's 4,100 uh, 4, watts worth of power, but we never get that. We get more like, 3,000, maybe 3,500, and just a couple of days ago, or yesterday maybe it was, I can't remember, day before, I got 4,000 and I was giddy. <laughs> right, I just have to pause for a second. Did you hear that? 4,100 watts yeah. 
of solar. I think the most I've heard of personally was around 2,500. You know, yeah, it's the 2,000 to, to 3,000 is definitely the range you normally see for reasonable people. I'm just very unreasonable <laughs> and like to go as big as I can. So we got the 380 watt panels or residential size. You'll see them shortly. Uh, and we built an infrastructure and basically our entire roof is either solar or ACs. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not going to go any bigger than that. Um, well, well, <laughs> well he has plans. so we have, we have been toying around with the design. Uh, David Hughes from home on the road, uh, YouTube channel. He helped me install this and he also owns a 390 and we're best buds. We add men the group together. We've been toying around with double stacked panels. And what we're talking about is using industrial doors, uh, drawer slides to mount one panel atop another so that when we're stationary, we'll pull the second panel out and have a wing and effectively double our solar. If we choose to go that far, I don't think I'll double everything, but I do think we're we're going to try to push it to like 5,000. <laughs> and then there'll be wings so the RV can fly. It can fly, like I said. <laughs> Later on, we'll be able to fly. <laughs> There's a lot of you know design that needs to go into this because we need to make sure it's wind resistant and you know can handle all of that. But the idea for us is we'd like to just squeeze a little bit more just so that our batteries always stay topped off because we're new at this. I know there are those of you out there that are like, Josh, stop freaking out. You can take the batteries to zero and charge them up again tomorrow. But what I've learned from our testing is our batteries only push up about 5% an hour. So as I'm watching that, um, sometimes we've got them as good as 5% per half hour, but that's only when the sun's directly overhead and we're getting the greatest angle we can get because ours are not tipped. You'll see they're just flat mounted. So if we're only getting 5% an hour, I don't want to go too low because I know I'll never hit 100 before we go to bed. Uh, here in our bathroom, I, I just I dislike kind of the wall texture everywhere. And so I decided to do a slate wall install in here on our mirror. And we were able to run oh, it beautiful. all the way up, get it behind the medicine cabinets, which actually these are, I guess, for something that isn't coming standard in all of them. But for some reason, we've got them so good for us. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, some people don't actually have these. And if you call Grand Design, they want like... $400 a piece for them, which I think is ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> we did change out the faucets because they come with a waterfall faucet that we really did not like. Every time you turn it on, the water would hit you in the stomach and oh. spray out with air in the lines. So I did switch out to these and they have a lot more pressure and we really like having them. Cool. Yeah, beautiful bathroom. Yeah, it's not tiny. That was one of my prerequisites. I said I must have a bathroom I can fit in. And as you can tell, I'm not a tiny guy. <laughs> yeah, I remember touring this and oh, the bathroom. <laughs> so we, we did get the king size bed. This is the doggy domain during the day. Uh, Nora <laughs> loves this spot. As you can tell, her toys get littered up here. She brings them up. But a couple things more about the, the kind of use of space. The dresser was here, but there was no shelving. So I came and put in a little bit of shelving right here so that we could extend it out in this little space that was just meaningless. But now her uh, uh, you know, clothes for the day, my slippers, and sometimes the- Very cool. Uh, the dishwashing soap goes here because we have the dishwasher, or the dishwasher, the laundry. Sorry. That looks familiar. Yeah. We really, I mean, this is one of the things that makes life a little easier for Elizabeth. It is heavy. It does add weight, but not having to leave and being able to get laundry done uh, makes a huge difference in her day. Just gathering it and going somewhere else, not even the cost of the, of getting it laundered, but the time loss for us is too much. Right. And I've had that from my very first RV. We paid to have it moved into the momentum, the same exact setup. Yeah. And oh man, yeah, it, it is like one of the first upgrades that you need because yeah having to, to take your laundry to a laundromat yeah and not and, fun. and i'll be honest we installed this ourselves um our dealer wanted to charge us way too much money for it so i bought them off amazon free shipping for 1600 bucks the whole shebang then we put it in ourselves now it's it's easy but difficult if you catch what i'm saying because it's not difficult to put it in but 
this angle and getting that in there was very hard. We had to tip this up and hold the mattress out of the way, take the door off the hinges because the washer's heavy. The dryer weighs nothing, but that washer was a pain. Right. I remember the move uh, with getting it from our Columbus RV into the momentum and we hired someone to do it. And oh, yeah. He, yeah, it was a struggle getting it moved over. So, gosh, props to you guys for yeah. for that and, and all of these things. And I hear you're going to do, what, first time, going to do a load? Yes, we're going to do a load of laundry on our batteries and solar because we want to see how much water it consumes. There is a setting on this washer that is uh, like a short half-hour efficiency wash that should use nine gallons or less. We are going to test that theory. Um, we're also going to see how much wattage the dryer is going to consume. Uh, I told her, always do it during the middle of the day. <laughs> I want to be taking off the solar, not the batteries. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. This is the brain control center for all of our solar panels. Without these components, we would be generating uh, no power. What we've got in here is we have twin uh, 3000 watt multi-plus inverters. You only see one because the other one is on the back side of this wall. We're gonna show you in a second. These right here are shutoffs for our solar panels. So we can use these breakers to shut off the power uh, to our unit um, if we need to maintenance anything between uh, those two points. This right here is our main switch. Right now we're on batteries only. One is generator, two is shore power. So we had run everything together so that no matter if we're plugged in, no matter if we're trying to run the generator, we just have an easy way to switch between those. Um, we didn't necessarily need it, but we found it much safer to do because if I'm working on the 50 amp line, I can disconnect that. If I'm working on the generator, I can turn and disconnect that so there's no back feeding of power through there. So in here we have three charge controllers from Victron. Um, one of these charge controllers has a six, six, uh, six panel bank, one has four panels, and one has what we call the orphan. It only has one panel. Now we went this way and you can tell this one is a 20, uh, 250, 100. And the other two are 150, 100s. We went this way because I wanted to have this one to be able to expand to more panels. Um, as you heard me talk about a little bit ago, if we ever do that, we don't have to upgrade and add a new piece of equipment. This is our main shutoff to our batteries. If I turn this to off, we would not be pulling any power from our batteries and just be pulling power from our solar panels. Um, these guys right here are what they call the Lynx distributors. These are like fancy smart bus bars. So all of our wires from everything come into these and then distribute back to our batteries and to the multi pluses. Uh, back here we have one last um, one for our orphan panel or the new series of panels. So this little guy down here, this is our step down. We're running a 24 volt system because 24 volts is more efficient when you're running a solar bank and a solar uh, battery bank at, at our size. But most of the rig, a lot of the key components run off 12 volt. So we have this to step it down. This is the piece that stopped working on Sunday when we woke up and we were getting no 12 volt power. So all we did was disconnect it, as you can see here, ran the wires back behind and connected it back to our um, old converter that came with the, the rig. And I'll show you that in a little bit. Um, that pretty much ends us for this part right here. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't talk about these. These are actually interrupts for our, uh, for our multi pluses. So if I switch one of these to off, it's gonna turn off one multi plus and the other multi plus. We have two because we have a 50 amp system and having two allows me to have one 3000 watt inverter per leg. That is just, I've never seen again a system this big before on an RV. <laughs> so for us to be able to open this wall, uh, I'm gonna, right now I'm gonna take out this false panel that we have. And I don't know if, if you have a solitude, you may realize there's more space here than there used to be. We've actually pushed this wall back and we've pushed this wall way back. It used to be all the way out here. It was right here and we've just shoved it back because it was empty space. So to access the behind this wall, uh, we created a frame and structure that allows us to pull this open. It has a hinge on the back side. Right here, I'm on a magnet. I keep the right ratchet that I need to get this open. The reason we do that is if there's an emergency, I don't want to be digging through tools to find the right ratchet to get behind here. This entire wall will open up. You now see our other twin multi plus our wheel system that we used uh, we bolted through the three-quarter plywood and used a really heavy-duty shelf stabilizer to exist a solid metal because we didn't want it to bend a lot of the other right angles so that we could see we're going to be too weak 
Um, just use a regular rubber caster, not plastic, wanted rubber to kind of absorb the bottom a little bit. Um, right. Back here, I don't know how much you can see, but we have two boxes. The box right here on the bottom side is a 50 amp breaker that will interrupt between shore power and will interrupt between our generator. That way, if anything catastrophic ever happens at our shore power or with our generator, it's going to stop before it destroys our entire system. <laughs> nice. This box is a junction box where we bring together the power from both multipluses and then only ran two wires um, over to our, our distribution panel in the rig itself. We could have run four, but we wanted to be more efficient with wire because it's so expensive. <laughs> um, back here, you can just see the behind the rig. You know, Now, before, if I ever wanted to access any of these things, I only had the one panel that came out and I had to have to crawl around. Now we have really unfettered access to maintenance. Anything back here can get to the water heater uh, much easier. Um, and our other inverter that I told you that we stepped back to, it's right behind here on the steps. That gray box. Oh, right. right. That's what originally <laughs> is already in there. And yep, we recognize that. Kept it. <laughs> wow, amazing setup. I mean, that is so cool. It took, uh, like we said before, it took us several months. Um, a lot of power, manpower, and a lot of thinking and rethinking and rethinking, but we finally got what we like. And uh, uh, David Hughes, I have to give super props to him, and uh, he basically architected the system, helped me put it together. It was his brainchild, and we learned so much on the way. Um, I know that he's very eager to install his system on his rig. Now that we've learned all of the mistakes on my rig, <laughs> we were the guinea pig. Uh, but uh, he's uh, without him, this wouldn't happen. So would you recommend a DIY project like this or hire a professional? How much money do you have? <laughs> so if you have enough money to hire a professional and you're doing a, uh, you know, something of this size, you know, let them do it. But if you're like us and the retail price would have been so exorbitant that there's no way you could have gotten a set this size with this many panels and this many batteries, then DIY is your option. But the key is finding someone great to work with. You know, find your David Hughes. Maybe it is David, maybe he's in your area and he can help you do it. Or maybe it's someone like him who can help you walk through because you'll learn. And why is it important that you learn? Because your installer is not riding with you. He does not live in your RV. And when you have problems like we've had, you need to have your have had your hands on it and understand it. As much as Battleborn and Victron try to tell you that this stuff's bulletproof and it'll never break down, it will. And the more you know about it, the better off you'll be. So here's our generator. Uh, this is my next project. It's actually um, exhaust hose and I'm gonna be running my exhaust outside with enough coil for me to be able to pull this out we, we ran we basically bought a 50 amp plug that had wires on the other end we ran that all the way back to our power wall so when I'm ready I bought a generator specific for the fact that I already had a 50 amp RV plug on it so we can just plug this right in start the generator uh, we ran hose so that we are actually connected to both of our propane tanks because I know propane is less efficient so if we're in an emergency situation, I don't want to have to come out and switch tanks. <laughs> this guy opens up. Maybe. And then can pull out so that I can maintenance the generator. I can do my oil changes. You can tell here, I took the gas tank off. One, so it would fit. But two, because we didn't plan on carrying another fuel source. So it's propane only now. Right now, it's propane only. Okay. That way we carry diesel and propane. Our old batteries actually stay intact. Our, our entire 12 volt system, we didn't change it. We left it in place. We're just charging it through the regular means. Okay. So if right now our 12 volt system thinks that we're on shore power because it's pulling from the inverters. So what is that? <laughs> <laughs> just because we live in an RV and just because we travel around doesn't mean we can't have a smoker. We, I wanted to get one of the travel ones where the legs fold up and it's super easy to get lifted in and out. But of course, when we were trying to buy, they were all sold out. So I bought a full size trigger and I bought a more ride slide. And now we just pull the grill out. And when we're ready to cook. Look at that. I open it up, put my grease down. And then on this side, we put a little device in, which basically puts a, fixes a nut to the metal, so I just take out this little bolt, twist up my chimney, and reattach, 
plug it in and we're off. Um, and to be quite honest with you, I was concerned about how much power this was going to draw. So we did a test. It only pulls 200 watts. Really? At 400 degrees, it was pulling 200 watts. Wow. So it's very efficient power wise. And when you're in an environment like this where you're not wanting to run on your ACs and you don't want to start the oven in the house, we bake pizzas on it. Uh, we put desserts on it. Um, you know, and of course I smoke meat twice a week on it. But uh, yeah, we, we love the smoker for sure. That is super cool. It just rolls right out like that. And it only needs, uh, I want to say like two to three feet clearance from the wall. And it needs about only five feet, six feet clearance um, high. So even with the awning out, if we've done it in the rain and it's no problem, the only time you get a little smoke inside is when it's in its preheat phase and it's ramping up, you can get some white smoke inside. But other than that, when it runs, you just get the, the nice smell. And then we just push it back away. So over here on this side, we've got a couple of things going on. One, our batteries are actually stored right behind here. They slide behind the fireplace like we showed you. And I wanted them to butt all the way up against the wall. And my 50 amp plug on the inside takes up about that much room. So we had to move it. You wanna know it's super easy. It's color coded on the inside. You really have to be working hard to mess it up. So if you ever have to work on this plug or replace this, if it's burnt up at a RV park where you were at, be encouraged that it is not hard to do. Um, so I moved that up here and the old hole that was down below, that's where my cable comes from my Starlink. And then this right here is actually, I'll show you guys, is just a coupler uh, for Cat6. And so you've got, this is the cable going to the satellite and then the other cable in here runs up to my Starlink. It is a special kind of cable. It has to be 25 aught uh, Cat6 cable because you can get up to 100 watts pushing through this up to the panel um, in cold times because it will self-heat and melt the snow and ice off of itself. <laughs> uh, obviously we don't have that issue right now, but you always want to make sure you have the right kind of cables because if you don't send enough power to it, you could cause it trouble. So this is a weather tight seal that goes around that coupling. So even if it rained out here or anything, we got no problems. It just tightens right on that rubber. And where do you find something like that? So I got this um, off of Amazon. Um, I got the um, a cable from a link that we're going to add in the description below because I can't remember what it is, but there is a company who has started making aftermarket cables and couplers for Starlink stuff because you can't find it anywhere yet. Uh, but I will say that you can find some of their stuff once you go there and you see what it is. You can find it on Amazon for quite a bit cheaper. So awesome. uh, we'll put some of those links below. But this cable now, you can see that I have, all my slack is right here. It comes, the dish comes with a hundred foot cable fixed which kind of sucks, but it is what it is. It's the first design that's come out. So we leave all our slack right here and let's come on back and look at our, our dish. So our first iteration is a three quarter piece of conduit that we got from Home Depot and then a couple of stacked hose clamps so that I could make a big enough area to grab with this uh, U-bolt uh, to really keep this thing steady. And why is it important to keep it steady? Because the dish only has about a 2% sway tolerance. If it sways more than 2%, it will lose connection with the satellite that it's talking to. So normal like nylon poles or uh, flag poles that a lot of people try to use, they don't work because they have too much sway. Now we're already working on our second adaptation because they have a mount that you can screw into a roof and then the top, the dish itself, will actually just snap onto that just like it snaps onto the pole adapter that we have right now. So if we change to that, Elizabeth will only have to run up the ladder, click. Instead of this, it's pull, attach, everything's steady, run up the ladder, click. And we, we always try to be as efficient as we can with all of our setup and tear down because when you do it 50 times and 100 times, <laughs> it gets old pretty quick. Right, every little increase in efficiency <laughs> saves that time. That's yes, awesome. absolutely. But it's the least full it's ever been. Oh we, yeah, when we just first, when we look first at had that. It, it was like, we had this thing full. And because we, we only kept what we needed until we realized we didn't need it. And so we've over time really shelled this down to less and less and less, you know. And so down here we keep like our overstock. We have a case of our favorite chips couple cases of my wife's favorite drinks because we do use Amazon a lot but when you start boondocking you have less opportunities to receive shipments <laughs> right. than you did when you were always in parks who were always happy to receive your shipments 
um, keep our ladder back here, our, our washing materials, and a lot of our leftovers. So a lot of this stuff is left over from our solar install, and we're just keeping it until we're for sure, for sure, we don't need to do any modifications. But again, one of the things about this solitude model is the massive, massive storage. Yeah. It's like, look at that. It, it, eight <sighs> foot slide can hold 800 pounds distributed. Um, obviously we don't have anywhere near that right now, but there have been times in the past where we've had it pretty loaded down. And after seeing this before, we joked about this being like the guest bedroom, just throwing a bed in there and... <laughs> It does. It catches all. You know, it definitely ends up being a catch all, but it's nice to have a place that's a catch all because when you're in an RV living full time, everything has to have a home and it has to go away as soon as you're done using it. Like in your house, when you could afford to just set this thing here for a while or just set this thing here, you can't do that in the rig because as soon as you do it, it's in your way. It is now <laughs> in the way of something else that you're trying to do and it's annoying. And so it's, I'm always running after everything like, okay, if it doesn't have an easy home, you won't put it away. So make sure that your everyday use items are easy to store and easy to get to. Otherwise you either won't get them out um, and forget about them or you won't put them away and they'll just annoy you. They they look so impressive up there. <laughs> yeah, the <laughs> solar panels protect the roof. Yeah, so our, our uh, anyway, to, to use these type of panels, to use residential panels, you have to support their weight and most of, uh, important, support their middle flex because this so solar panels are glass and no matter you know what size you get. So when they're the bigger, they flex more in the middle. So what we've done up here is we've both put a piece of a three quarter aluminum uh, tube down the middle of each one with rubber window gasket above that. So the glass can move, but it can only move about a quarter of an inch and it is supported. So it allows it to bounce as we drive without flexing so much that it cracks. The second thing we did is on the edge of each one inside and out, we put a standoff and a C channel with more of that rubber gasket so that the frame edges, not just the glass, but the frame can bounce, but only about a quarter of an inch. Because before we did that, we could move the panel. Now it's more rigid and we cannot. So it does give it some leeway without them breaking on the way to our next destination. <laughs> That's important. So we, of course, a lot of these solitude rigs come and most rigs come with one filter on board, but that really wasn't enough for us because we have some special destinations we want to go to. And just around the US water quality is really fluctuative. So we bought a clear source uh, filter system from Amazon. Um, we cut all the metal off and mounted it directly to the wall. It's a three stage filter that we plumbed in line to run with our filter that came with the rig. So effectively we have four stages. We go from 10 microns down to 0.2. Why is that important? 0.2 removes bacteria. So you could go down to Mexico, pull some water in and be able to use the groundwater. Wow. That's pretty big. Yeah, water is such an important thing. We can go a long time without food, but we can't go without water. <laughs> no, right. Gosh, we almost forgot to talk <laughs> about one of your biggest upgrades yes. yet. Yes. Tell us about your suspension upgrade. Okay, so in the beginning, we thought we had 8K suspension and uh, the the axles that came from the dealer, or the, sorry, that came from Grand Design, but that turned out to be kind of a, let's just call it extra, uh, narrative that the dealer told us thinking that we got a good rig so when we got it and realized that we only had 7k what was important to us was the extra carrying capacity number one and number two what was going to be important to us was the stability that a uh, higher grade would offer us so we got the 8k independent suspension from Moride. we drove all the way up to elkhart and we went there and what's really cool about that is they actually let you stay inside your rig so we went we we plugged it in overnight they start at 6 a.m in the morning they pull it in and then when they're done in the afternoon we got to go stay inside their warehouse in our rig overnight so no need for a hotel super cool they gave us a, a place to sit while we were there they fed us lunch but let's talk more about the upgrade so what essentially happens down here is you have an axle but if you get independent suspension they're going to take that axle away they're going to cut them off and take them away they're going to put on the independent suspension module which is going to go right on the back of the tire and there's a beam that goes all the way across that uh, provides some more support for this independent suspension each one of these now operates independently so if one tire hits a pothole 
before with the axle, that vibration would have carried all the way across the rig, maybe caused it to uh, go back side to side, which we know makes our dishes fall, makes our cabinet doors come open. So now when this hits a pothole, it bounces. All of the other tires don't know anything happened because of an airbag that's in the back there. With your regular leaf springs and the, the blue uh, connectors, forget what they're called. What are those called? The shackles. The shackles. Uh, when one hits, um, you only have about two inches of play. With the independent suspension, you have five inches of play with the airbag that's back there that Morite has put together. So you have a lot more ability to absorb a ton of shock before it affects the actual rig. So that to us was a huge improvement that we've seen in chucking, um, a huge improvement in dishes and things seeming disheveled, the fridge seeming completely like, you know, shooken to death. Uh, now we see a lot less of that. You still see it, especially boondocking on rough roads, but you see less of that. And that everything, everything you can do to avoid that vibration is going to extend the life of the rig. It's going to extend the life of everything inside the rig. Um, in addition, we also got the hydraulic brakes. Now, if you don't have them, you may think, man, that's an expense I don't want to spend. Like the day we got them, we were on the highway heading south, back down to southern Indiana, and someone jumped on a highway in front of us and slowed down. And I had to slam on my brakes, which you know, anytime you're in a rig, when you slam them, you think bad things are about to happen. We had so much stopping power that the rig pulled my truck back. And we realized that the, the rig had more stopping power than our truck at that point. And that just gave me such a feeling of assurance that I don't want to be in a bad situation, but if I am, now I have the ability, both stability and stopping power that we didn't have before. Wow, awesome. And uh, how did you find out about the Morite independent suspension system? So we found out about it because we started doing research once we realized we did not have what we thought we had was disc brakes and a higher grade suspension. Um, I started searching and I found out that it was built by Morite and installed by Morite. So I said, who's Morite? And, you know, <laughs> and we contacted them and we found out just a little thing for you guys. If you can schedule in the winter, you will get an additional winter discount because they oh, have nice. a lot fewer people wanting to come in when it's cold and snowy. So we said, fine, we did it in December. We did it a week before Christmas uh, because we wanted to get in there and we were already in Indiana. So know that if you can afford to be there that time of year, you can uh, save a little bit. Okay, awesome. And our friends Chad and Tara from Changing Lanes also have the complete oh, yeah. installation yes. on this particular and system. And they do an amazing video of riding inside their rig uh, before and after. I remember that. It's very cool. So we'll put a link down below to their video. We were as super well. wishy washy about the installation because of its cost. That video sent us over the edge. Like uh, it made it where it was like, okay, this totally makes sense. Awesome. And but yeah, we were at the rally two years ago, the national rally, and uh, Jason and Ray from Getaway Couple had just gotten theirs, so it was pretty cool. Awesome. To... And what is the cost? Uh, Elizabeth? Uh, we paid roughly $7,500. Um, I don't know how much of that was their winter discount. Uh, I believe I think the, it... the winter discount is only about 10%. Okay, so I think it might be around 8000 Okay, did that include the brakes? Yeah, yes. that was all in. Oh wow, I was expecting a lot higher no. price than I mean, that. honestly, that was fine. And, and if you're creative financiers like us, they're willing to write it across several credit cards if you have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean, upgrades are not cheap, but man, when you consider the longevity... It's protecting the investment, right. for sure. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. We just got uh, the disc upgrade as well, and disc brake upgrade as well. And yes, stopping power and confidence on the road. Yeah. Wow. And and it's, going up Teton Pass and down. I was going to say, yeah, these mountains, and, when you're riding that 6% grade, it just brings... I mean, I'm still oh nervous, man. no matter how many yeah. times we do it, but just knowing that I could stop. We, I forget, we ran into another family at another place, and they were telling us how he actually was smoking his brakes. They were locking up trying to come down a mountain because, one, he had too big of a rig and too small of a truck, and two... He uh, did not have the uh, any sort of upgraded brakes on his, and he was telling me how scared he was, and I thought to myself, I'm glad that's not us. Uh, yeah. Sheree and I have had many white knuckle mountain driving before we got the new truck, yeah. and, and now adding the, yeah, the new brakes is right. like, 
so much more confident. So what do you pull the, your massive grand design RV with? <laughs> uh, if, if we get one question in our 390 Facebook group a uh, lot, uh, just underneath what internet do you use, it's what truck do you use to pull <laughs> this right. huge thing. We went with a uh, Dodge Ram 3500 one ton dually. And the reason we did is because I had never pulled a trailer before in my life. I'd never had a large truck like this, but I knew I wanted the most truck I could get so that I would just be safe. You know, some people do pull this rig with a single uh, single rear wheel. I wouldn't want to. I prefer to have the dually just because it gives me that extra stability and stopping power. Right. Oh, love the dually for sure. Now, do you guys pull with a dually as well? Uh, yeah, we've got a 450 uh, Ford, um, so that... Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, a little. It's it's overkill, but you'd rather right. be that way than I would, under. When we're going up a mountain and I can maintain 45, 50 miles an hour, I feel much safer than the guy who's dragging at 20 miles an hour because he doesn't have the power he needs to get this thing up a hill. Right. And did you go up Teton Pass? We did. How did it handle that? It, it did handle it well. You know, and the thing is, is you just learn to respect what your truck wants to do. Right. Not forcing the truck to do what you want it to do. You know, if the truck decides it needs to go 30, I will let it go 30. And that's the biggest thing is pushing it. I see people all the time, well, my tires on my rig are rated for 75, so I go 75. That could be a huge mistake. You yes, know? I'm glad you brought that up. And how fast do you normally travel? Uh, we travel somewhere between 60 and, say, 70 miles an hour, depending on okay. the ground we're on. You know, if we're in Nebraska and it's flat, I might go 70 because the truck doesn't care when we're not on a grade. But right. if we're on a grade, you know, we may go 50, we may go 45. But our, our average speed, I would say, is 65 miles an hour. Yeah, we stay at 60 and we just leave it at that and partly that's you know fuel economy and well, sure but right it's it's so funny when you see other rvs go blasting oh, past yeah. you and it's like whoa slow down man <laughs> <laughs> have you seen a tire failure on an oh, rv and you don't want that <laughs> you know we we actually just had our first blowout on the truck um, really on our way uh, heading this direction and okay. thanks to our tpms you know on the truck we were able to identify what was happening before it blew oh man and we're able to get off the side of the road as it was blowing so i mean we you know not not that it's never going to happen but when it does don't freak out you know always pay attention what was our first indicator was that when my wheel started pulling heavily to one side uh, my first thought was maybe i need an alignment but then i realized it was pulling really bad and so i switched over to my tpms and realized that my pressure was dropping went ahead and started making our way over boom my wife says that was a rock, right? You know, and I said, that's wishful thinking. Uh, and we get over and of course the wheel's completely gone, but our roadside assistance was there in no time, you know, maybe 45 minutes and we were back on the road and we had a tire at the next time, uh, town we went to within a half hour. And I mean, it couldn't have gone smoother. Um, I guess the key here is just don't freak out. That's, that's super cool. Was it a rear tire? It was then? a front drive tire. Oh, it was front? this one right here. Okay. Uh, and it just, uh, now, on the inside, must have hit something sharp because it had a massive blowout. I mean, it was just wow. tines and then wires and I, I yeah. <laughs> well, so pay attention to your tires. Yes. Get a TPMS system yes. if your truck doesn't already come with it. And, and so. make sure you have one on your rig as well because yes. there's nothing like being forewarned. You know, the last thing you want is to see your back swinging because you've lost tire. You don't want to ruin a rim because replacing a tire is a few hundred bucks. Replacing a rim gets into a whole new deal. Right, and, and we have several videos out with our tire damage on our previous RV mm -hmm. with several blowouts. And so from experience, right, it's not just the tire that blows, It's it could just be right. thousands and thousands of you, you, dollars you could, in damage. You could ruin your axle, you could ruin your leaf spring. You, I mean, there's lots of things, and be, so just knowing. Besides the safety danger to you yourselves and right. others on the road. Yeah. So awesome. Well, glad you got a truck that you're happy with because, uh, and, and again, we see this all the time is too big RV, yep. too little truck. Yes. <laughs> and, and the people say thing, you know, uh, there's a saying out there that says, you know, don't, don't buy when you're buying your RV, you know, buy the RV that, that you really want. Don't, you know, necessarily, um, buy this one that you're going to step into. And if you do do that, if you do decide to go that route, don't buy a tiny truck, like buy your forever truck because it will grow with you with your RV. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You guys have such a beautiful home here. Thank you. Uh, what advice would you give to newbies just starting out? 
the newbies who are just starting out, I think one of the most important things you do is you do it. You do get out there, you do tow your rig or drive your rig, you do go to places that are a little outside your comfort zone. Because if you, the longer you wait to figure out you can do it, then the longer you spend not knowing what you can actually achieve. And you know, because the, the fear gets in the way, it just does. Right, and I was surprised to find out how many people, as we post our pictures on Facebook uh, and YouTube, about how how much afraid people are of coming out here for safety. Mm -hmm. yeah. They think this isn't safe right. yeah. out here, and I, I think it, it could be more safe than an RV park. Yeah, I actually very much is, and I'll speak to your point. When we were finishing our solar install, we had a somewhat tweaker person come up and linger looking at all the copper wire we had asking to come Seattle. inside our rig oh very much casing our rig like he was going to steal some stuff and so we had to start locking everything down you know even during the day while we were using it i've had zero of that fear and preoccupation here because the folks who choose to come out here they're typically more self-contained. They understand the environment. They're they're more um, yeah. aware of you and giving you space. Yeah. Whereas at the RV park, everyone's just kind of on top of each other and yeah. no one really respects I, your space. I've seen people here um, leave and leave their chairs or their generator sitting there and then come back hours later to get it. Like No one took it. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, we've seen people leave their RVs completely open. Yeah. Just a screen door open mm -hmm. right there to keep it cool off during the day. And it's like, mm -hmm. that's that's awesome. <laughs> well, when we bought, yeah. sorry to interrupt you, but when we bought this rig, I remember saying to you, well, it's okay. We're never going to boondock. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this kind yeah. of rig is fine for us to have because we're always going to be plugged into shore power. We're never going to buy solar. We're never going to do And we said those things. We're we never, said no never, to never. the generator. We don't need that. We're always going to be plugged in, yep. you know? <laughs> and things changed in only one year of travel. We decided we wanted more freedom. We wanted to be able to come out here where we can really experience the outdoors. Yeah. Even though, like I said before, we're not outdoorsy people, that doesn't mean we don't want to appreciate and yeah. be surrounded by it. We were tired Absolutely. of being in the inner city crowded RV parks and we wanted to be we were like this isn't what we got into this lifestyle for right so, exactly yeah. and it just and you can you can enjoy both there's benefits yeah. of both yeah I mean unlimited water is kind of a nice thing yeah it's super you nice. know and <laughs> easy uh, access to restaurants is very convenient yeah you know? <laughs> there's no hat for the water yet you're kind of you're limited to that yeah. or yeah. what you can bring back and I, I think one of the things we wish we would have bought before we got out here is a water bladder that fits in our truck so that we can go get some water if we needed to um, we don't have a way to dispose of our black water unless we're dragging it back into town. And so there are some things that right. we still don't have. But we've talked about switching to a composting toilet. So I don't know. Maybe that will happen. There you go. <laughs> um, like we just got a water bladder, massive 150 gallon water mm. bladder. Uh, it works great. Yeah. And yeah, we've had the blue tote for years. Yeah. So uh, yeah, actually, so we actually have a few things you guys don't have yet. You do. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> What's been your biggest challenge uh, to this lifestyle, would you say, so well, far? I'll, I'll go first on that. Um, I think the biggest one is finding the balance between working and enjoying where we are. Because there have been times where I'm just stressing, like I have all these emails and all this stuff and I haven't finished these projects. Uh, and I will we'll get to a beautiful place and I will just stay in, other than walking the dogs I'm in the rig. I'm at my computer and I'm just work work working And then there's other times where it's like, you know, we're we're right next to two national parks here We got to go. So, you know yesterday I rescheduled my my students that I, I only had two students scheduled So I just pushed them to another day and uh, we drove around in the national parks and bought an annual pass and now we're motivated to go to some other ones nice. <laughs> you yeah. know and so finding that balance of how do i how do i enjoy my lifestyle enjoy the places i am meet new people like you guys um but still get my work done so that i can have money to pay for all this stuff yeah because <laughs> just because you're free boondocking doesn't mean you have no expenses <laughs> exactly uh, you know and i'll touch on that with uh, people often in the groups will ask you know how much money do you save living in an rv and i will say um after a year of math none <laughs> at least this far because we keep, 
<laughs> because we keep spending it on upgrades and modifications right. and stuff. But we looked at it and we we're like, yeah, we spent about the same as we were doing when we were renting a house. Yeah. So, uh... We haven't spent any more, but we found that our numbers very much matched up to what our, our house But uh, maybe was. going forward, maybe this next year will be cheaper. Yeah. So a lot of those are fixed costs. <laughs> right. So once like yeah. the solar. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like we joked, we said, uh, you know, you said this week is zero cost. Actually, this week cost me $30,000. It's a $30,000 stay in the wilderness because we'll start appreciating that over time because we're not going to continuously spend that amount of money on the solar, but right. one time will stretch and give us more opportunity. Same yeah. thing with a lot of the, the more right install of the independent suspension we did. That was a huge cost last year, but that has really added a lot to our stopping power with the disc brakes and with our independent suspension with especially going down some of these roads. And we wouldn't have been able to add the solar. I don't think it would have put us way too overweight. So right. having that extra carrying capacity yeah. allowed us to do that. So hopefully here's crossing our fingers to the next year having zero huge expenses. Yeah, there, there you go. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. For someone that's looking at this lifestyle for the very first time and they're thinking, well, I can't afford that what would you tell them I, I would tell them to go rent an RV and spend a week out doing this before they even start thinking about you know buying one because we jumped in head over you know just right off the edge and went straight into a huge 43 foot rig with a truck that we end up being 60 feet long but that might be too much money or too scary for you. So I would rather them get out there and start experiencing it because honestly, unless you've owned different types of rigs, you don't know what you want and you don't know what you don't like okay. until you're living in it. Now, unfortunately, if there were tons of things we hated about this rig, we'd be stuck with it because yeah. we're in it, you know? And with these yeah. mods, we're not getting out of it anytime <laughs> right. soon. Or, you know, or maybe buying an older one and, and, and living in it for a few months just to make sure that this is the lifestyle you want. And the longer you're in it, the more you'll discover what you like and what you don't like. Like here, I thought that I was going to be really missing having a dishwasher. That was something that I wanted, I didn't get. But you know what? It's huh, I don't miss it. It's fine. You know? Yeah. So. And for those of you who know you're going to buy and you're going to start moving into this, I highly suggest you start treating your house like an RV. Limit your kitchen to two cabinets or three cabinets. You know, start taking away things like your dishwasher, shut it off so you can't use it. Because you don't want the shock of getting in the rig and then suddenly realizing you're still reliant on a lot of those things. That is great advice. Yeah, and start early getting rid of things. Yes. yes. You know? we, had to liquidate, we liquidated our house during the initial part of the pandemic. Oh, it was rough. March, <laughs> April was ridiculous. We had to do everything by appointment only on Facebook Marketplace, answer dumb questions till the cows came home, and people asking us to drive across Houston for a $15 item. You oh, know? wow. So we it was rough, but we got it done. Yeah. Um, we had two business locations where the stuff plus our home thing. So we had wire shelving everywhere like a store. We had people coming back two or three times. So it took us wow. a full-time job to get it done. Start as early as you can. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, People totally. always underestimate that, how long yeah. it takes. And, I mean, here's an example. Uh, we met some young ladies at our last spot. I think they're going to stop by here. I don't know if they're bringing their bus, but three young ladies from 18 to 21 years old bought an old school bus yeah. and converted it mm -hmm. themselves. Yeah. Wow. And they did it all for less than five thousand dollars. See nice. the bus nice. and all the upgrades. Yeah, and they're out here enjoying the same view. Yes, in a five thousand dollar or less than five thousand yeah. dollars. So yeah. I mean, it can be this huge range and still mm -hmm. right. enjoy it, this it's, lifestyle. It's, it's about what you want. Don't start looking at RVs thinking like they're the measurement. You know, this brand or that brand, or I need to be in a Grand Design, or I need to be in a, a Tiffin, or I need to be in a whatever. Find what really speaks to you. Go to a, as many of the RV shows as you can. Walk as many of them as you can, because really, while they're all the same, they're all incredibly different. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's little nuances that drew us to this one, but there were other things we liked better about other ones. Find the one that is the closest to your desire that you can, mm -hmm. and then make the mods that you yeah. need. And, right. and, and, and find the thing, you know, what are the things that are most important to you that really can't be modified? Like, we really wanted a large shower. We didn't want the little curved corner shower. That would have been very difficult for us to modify, so that was one of the things we wanted to get versus some of the other little things we could change ourselves. Yeah. Well, gosh, thank you so much for sharing your home with me and everybody else out there. I mean, I know you've 
you've got these amazing stories that are going to be very inspiring to help encourage other people to do this. And uh, for those of you that want to know more about uh, what you're teaching and getting a heart, getting started, uh, we'll put your information down below. They can check that out. And gosh, it's, it's just so awesome to run into you guys like this. And, and I think we've mentioned that before, but you meet the coolest people yes. on the road. You really yes, do. Yes, you do. I, I think we meet more people here than any subdivision we've ever lived in. Because we lived in um, a, a condo housing in kind of the center of Houston where there's thousands of people around us and we knew, we knew the help. We didn't know any of the people. Right? But right. we meet more yeah. people out here than we ever did in, yeah. in the, med, well, the third largest, fourth largest city in the U.S. Just because here people want to know you and if you're open to that. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And yeah. kind of like the time thing you said, you've got time yes. yeah. to connect with people. Right. You're not yeah. working 12, yeah. 13 hours a no day. No commute. <laughs> right. Ish. <laughs> totally. So, I mean, you know, safe travels to yeah. you guys. Maybe we'll run into you again sure. down the road. Yeah. Thanks for watching, guys. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button. I know this was a different video from what we normally do, but we always want to bring great value. And I think there's just so much great information here. So comment down below. What did you think of this amazing tour? Let us know. So uh, until next time, remember to all of you, enjoy, enjoy your, your journey. journey.